So you mentioned that you have another book coming out um, next year. So can you give us a little preview of that? Yes, I can. Um, this book is set in Denmark in 1943. Fun story to write. And um, Elsa Jensen is an American physicist. And she is studying, she's doing her postdoctoral studies in Copenhagen at the Niels Bohr, what's now called the Niels Bohr Institute. At the time, it was called the Institute for Theoretical Physics. And I was a chemistry major, so I knew Niels Bohr's name. I mean, it's like, Niels Bohr? I know who he is. I mean, he was, you know, he, he, he's huge in, in chemistry and physics. So, um, like, and his name kept popping up in my research because he, he's his story um, was quite fascinating during World War II. So I thought, well, wouldn't it be fun to have an American woman being a physicist at his institute at that time? Like, and I love, I, obviously, I really enjoy these stories of women who, who do things that women aren't supposed to do at the time. I'm just drawn to that. So like, here's this woman theoretical physicist. And they weren't, there were actually several women at the institute at the time. So it wasn't like, it was like pretty history. So and because she's a woman, they often give her secretarial tasks. Oh, you're a girl. You know how to do this. So um, she's got this horribly sexist um, senior physicist that she's working with who sends her off to do mimeographing because she's a girl. So, and she bucks it, but she ends up doing it because she's, she is a very nice girl. So she, she does what she's told. And so she's- What is, what is mimeographing? Um, before what we did before Xeroxing. So there's this, this big drum in the middle that's filled with ink. And then you've got a stencil that they put on it and they've got paper on one side and they you turn it by hand. They have electric ones. So you turn it by hand and it turns as it sucks paper in and it prints and then shoots it on the other side. And it's a rather nice little device. But because of that, she has a good friend who's involved with making the illegal papers and against the Germans. So her friend cons her into printing these illegal papers. So that's, that's for, for a good girl. And, and Elsa is one who likes to follow the rules and make people happy. This is quite a stretch for her. So she gets involved with resistance. Meanwhile, <clears throat> Baron Henrik Ehlefeldt is, is a nobleman. And he is a man who has wasted his life on his own pleasures but when the Nazis invade, he just is struck by the emptiness of his life and he wants to do something for good, but he realizes he can't do it as who he is. So he tells everybody that he sailed, he's a, he was an Olympic rower. So he told everybody, I just rode to Sweden. He left a note for his dad. I'm rowing to Sweden. I don't want to live under the Nazis. And he takes on another identity as a shipyard worker, ironically at his own father's shipyard. And he grows this big scruffy beard and he's got this big brewer's belt. So he has no trouble getting a job, but to, to do this job, he has to pretend to be not very bright at all because if he starts talking too much, they'll hear, hear the culture in his voice. So he basically becomes this, um, you know, he calls himself a big dumb laborer. So that's, that's who he becomes. But in his off time, he uses his rowing skull and he, he takes messages across to Sweden. It's only 10 miles between Denmark and Sweden. And so he rows messages for the resistance. And he takes on the code name of the Howman, which means merman in Danish, which is he was inspired by Copenhagen's little mermaid statue because Hans Christian Andersen, he was from Copenhagen. And so he, he wrote the little mermaid. So he's inspired by the, the little mermaid who gives up her fins so she can, she gives her voice so she can um, have legs, so she can have mobility. So he gives up his voice as a nobleman to have mobility so he can go out there and work for the resistance. So obviously that he's, now he's got the secret identity, which is, oh my gosh, so much fun to work with. I've never played with a secret identity before. And so he's living in the same boarding house as Elsa and her best friend, Lila, and, you know, she, Matt, Lila is a mathematician, Elsa is a physicist. And so they're talking about these high and loft, lofty things. And Henrik is, is, you know, has to work, use like 10 words. And, but, so they, and they end up striking up this, this very unlikely friendship between these three people. 
And Elsa and Henrik are very attracted to each other and they both fight it. Um, Elsa's like, yeah, I, you know, she's got a PhD and she's very interested in this laborer um, who, and she knows that she, he, she can barely communicate with, with him, but she's drawn to him and he can't, he doesn't dare start anything with her because he can't reveal his, his real identity because it's, it's, it's much too dangerous. So we've got this, this, you know, kind of this forbidden romance and secret identities and whoo, and that was fun to write. And so we've got that going on, but they're both working with the resistance, but don't know the other one is working with the resistance. And then I get to um, work with the, the real life, incredible story of how the Danes rescued almost every single one of their Jews, sending them across to Sweden. Uh, amazing story. It, it, it's one, I think it's one of the most inspiring stories to come out of World War II. Uh, the Danish people, when they got the news that the Germans were going to cart off all their Jews on Rosh Hashanah in 1943, the Danish people just rose up as one and said, no, you are not taking our people. And they hid them all and then took them across in yachts and fishing boats and rowboats. And they were the out of 7,000 Jews in Denmark, the Germans only arrested 452. Just astonishing story. And one I've wanted to tell for a long time. So I was able to, to tell that story in this novel. So great, great fun story. So do you mean I have to wait till next February? Yes. <laughs> You've got me all <laughs> yes, you <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, I, uh, <laughs> I just turned it. I just, uh, I turned it in in February and I just finished the first round of edits. It still has two more rounds of edits to go. Um, they've got to put the catalog together, get it, get it printed, get it out to the, the, so it's, 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 I'm done with the story, but I'm not They're They're definitely not done with it. They've, they've got some work to do on it. So, so it's not ready yet. <laughs> Oh, it sounds great. <laughs> and I love your oh, passion. Yeah. Oh, the story. Oh, yeah. I just had, oh, yeah. I feel that about every book done. And I'm just getting, uh, if I could I'm show you, I'm going to show you. Yeah. So I'm in the business of outlining my next novel. So I've got like all these little strips of paper. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Cause I'm like trying to wrestle this plot and submission. So I'm like rearranging, like, wait, could this take place here or there? Oh, wait, wait. So I'm rearranging. It's a very odd way of plotting, but it's. I've never done it before, but I'm just playing with it right now. So, so I'm like super excited about this book that I'm going to be writing and that won't be coming out till 2024. So. You know, I find it amazing how authors can do that. You're, you're talking to me about books you re- wrote to say like two years ago. Yeah. You've got one, you're in kind of the edit sort of process and one you're going yes. to write. I... And- <laughs> and it's, it's always, and I, I, I was kind of stunned with it when my first book came out and realized it, but I was telling my author friends like, wait, you mean you're always publicizing book one, writing or editing book two and, or editing book two and then writing book three. They said, yes. I'm like, okay, all right. And you just kind of learn this flow to it. And so, and then, it, you know, each year as one book comes out, you shift and, and they, they kind of scoot themselves down the line. And then the, the other part of it is that, um, so this book that I'm outlining right now coming out in 2024, but there are two more books on that contract, which I'm noodling over. I already have the synopses written, the basic plot are, is written. So I, I had to write those to get my, my um, contract but I'm still noodling on them, like having ideas and writing those down, putting them away. And um, in two years, I'll need to put together a proposal for another three books. So the ideas are going, it's like, so what can I write about next? So in a way, there's also the, I'm working on, I'm always working on three projects, but there's always the future of, you know, thinking of other things in advance. So it's just getting the flow down. Um, this is my... Uh, until Leaves Fall in Paris was my 14th novel. So I, I think I'm finally used to the flow of it. <laughs> but yeah, and I'm a very linear person. I'm a very, I will totally concentrate on one project and work hard on it and get it done, you know, start to finish. I'm not one of these people who works on bunches of projects. So for me to 
always be working on three things is, is contrary to my nature, but you do what you have to do. <laughs> so. And so do you want to stay in this kind of time period or are you thinking some of your noodling is that different time period or? Well, right now, um, my next three books will be in World War II. Also the contract I have, which will be books coming out 24, 25, 26. Ah, um, our three World War II novels. As for the future, and this is this is a conversation I always have with my editor and my agent every three years when it comes time for another proposal. As you know, let's look at the market right now. World War II, when I first started writing, World War II fiction was passe; nobody wanted it. Um, obviously, if you look at it now, it is one of the hottest genres, and it's the first time in my life I've ever been on trend. <laughs> So like, obviously for right now, I definitely don't want to switch genres because I'm actually writing something that people want to read. So, like, and I, you know, the funny thing is, it's almost like, oh, you started writing it because it was popular. No, I, I started writing it when nobody, nobody wanted it. Nobody wanted it. So um, I, I feel like, okay, I'm, I'm in a really good place right now. But three years from now, who knows? Trends are trends. So it's something we have to keep in mind. Um, it would be very difficult for me to s- switch to a different era. I've done, as I said, I've done 20 years. I've been writing World War II novels now for 20 years. I've been doing research for 20 years. My knowledge of World War II is fairly deep. And because of that, I also know where to find resources. So when I start writing a different one, like, well, I, I don't know anything about my, my hero in the book I'm writing right now is a correspondent with the BBC on the radio. I, I don't really know much about that bits and pieces, but I know where to find the resources because I, I, I've, I've done enough research at this point. So I, I know where to go. So if I were to say switch to civil war or something, it would involve in immersing myself in an entire new world. Um, er- everything would be different from the language to the, the culture era. Everything's would be different. So if that were to happen, um, yeah, <laughs> I would. So we'll see. Every three years, I, I never say never. I never say, oh, well, I'll always write World War II because I don't know if I will or not. Um, but right now, I, I will keep writing it as long as I have ideas and the market allows me to because I really enjoy this writing about this time period. It's, it's fascinating to me. It seems like an endless wealth of, of, of ideas so um, I'll, I'll ride this trend as long, <laughs> as long as I can <laughs> until they kick me off. <laughs> yeah. Because it seems like they're, like I was saying, so many intricacies within the war and yeah, I mean, and, and, and it's so fun t- to read books when you're learning. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, well, thank you so much for talking with us today. It's, it's a pleasure. And um, I really enjoy your books. Um, I, I've read everyone we've talked about. I've read. <laughs> so thank I, just, you. I thank you. So thanks for joining us. Oh, thank you for having me.